The CEO of Life and Unichem Pharmacies believes it can compete against discount chain Chemist Warehouse. Look, it has had a bit of an impact on margins, but again, our strategy, it's around making sure we show value to the customer, coupled with our expert care and advice. And Tesla and Netflix both beat earnings expectations, but investors aren't impressed. Yeah, there was, there was positives and some yeah, negatives in, in both results. Uh, but as you saw, yeah, Tesla shares down uh, 10%, and yeah, obviously we had, a, had quite a, a similar sort of sell for Netflix as well. It's Monday the 24th of July, and you're watching Markets with Madison. I think we've probably all seen the Dan Carter ads, but no doubt you've also noticed the aggressive expansion of chemist warehouse stores across New Zealand. Personally, I always find myself going into them to stock up on cheaper vitamins, toothpaste, moisturiser and so many other things that I really do not need. But every time it's always so busy. When I was in there last, I thought surely this must have taken revenue and margin off the incumbents, namely Life and Unichem Pharmacy. Well, they're actually owned by the same company, listed Green Cross Health. So I reached out to its chief executive, Rachel Newfield, and asked her to have a chat. Rachel, lovely to see you. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. I would love to know the economics of a pharmacy. How does it work? How does a pharmacy make money? So if I think about a pharmacy, every pharmacy is different. That's part of the challenge. Uh, revenue broadly comes from three different sources. Uh, first source would be dispensing. So that's you come in with a script, your uh, pharmacist team uh, packs that and provides it to you and gives you advice about how to take that. So that's the first source. The second source is more services. So in recent years, probably your COVID vaccination, your annual flu vaccination, and then third would be products. So things to support you and your health, whether that's uh, cough cold support, skin maybe for you know, a teenager with acne, uh, or cosmetics. So every pharmacy is different as I mentioned. The, uh, I suppose the majority of the revenue tends to come from the first two sources, but it is absolutely different by pharmacy. Focusing on the products, the latter part of that revenue mix, what is the typical markup and is it larger for something like vitamins or is it larger for something like cosmetics and fragrance? Again, there's no fixed rule. It's really around market pricing and making sure that we're competitive. We're very focused on making sure that we show value to our customers. So we deliver expert care and advice with value. So yeah, it varies case by case. And on the first part of that revenue mix, the dispensing and things like vaccinations, is that government funded? They've just scrapped the prescription fee. So where is the revenue from that coming? Uh, so a few bits in that. The majority of those first two services, they are government funded. Uh, there are some private services as well. In terms of the dispensing fee, so if we just go back to thinking about what that was, it was a $5 tax that pharmacists collected on behalf of the government. So that wasn't revenue for pharmacies, that didn't go into the pharmacist owner's pocket at all. That was simply tax collectors taking that tax and passing it on to the government. So yes, the government has uh, scrapped that recently, which is a move we advocated for and absolutely welcome. You know, we all hear every day about this cost of living crisis going on and it's real. You know, five dollars really matters to many, many New Zealanders and we see that as a barrier for collecting medicines and the removal of that barrier now will enable so many more New Zealanders to access their medicines. And one of the benefits of that is when there's barriers to medicines collection, all that good work at the doctors is undone when someone doesn't take their medicine and they tend to end up in the hospital emergency department. And those hospital emergency departments are pretty busy. So the removal of that tax is really going to benefit New Zealanders, not only putting more money in their back pocket, but it's going to ease some of the burden on the hospitals. Yeah, hospitals certainly are busy, and if somebody does have to go and see their GP, that's also quite expensive. And as you mentioned, we are in this cost of living crisis. So is that benefiting pharmacies? Are you getting more sick people coming in here to buy over-the-counter medicines as a cheaper option to wellness? It's very early days with the prescription copay just being removed from the 1st of July. Uh, but at this point, we're certainly seeing a change in customer behaviour. Uh, the immediate behaviour we're seeing is where $5 really matters. A customer in the past would come in with a script and maybe it had, say, three or four items on it. And they would uh, ask the pharmacist for advice about which ones they really needed. And of course, they need all of them. So the change we're seeing is that we're able to provide all the medicines to the customers so that they can actually go home, get well and focus on being healthy. And just specifically on that government funding for things like vaccinations, how much roughly is the government paying per vaccine to a pharmacist to distribute it? And is that different depending on what vaccine they're offering? 
Uh, again, it, it does vary uh, considerably by vaccination, uh, and part of it is uh, reimbursing the pharmacists for the cost of the vaccine itself and then an administration fee related to the labour. So it, it varies depending on whether it's COVID, depending on whether it's, uh, say, for a shingles vaccine or a flu vaccine. The pharmacy that we're in today, Rachel, has very filled, beautiful looking shelves, but many of them don't. I do know that trying to source a lot of medicines is a struggle at the moment. Has that become slightly easier in recent months or is it still really hard? Uh, it still has its challenges and has still had ups and downs. During COVID, we certainly saw a number of supply chain challenges for medicines and uh, there were constant supply restrictions and substitutions. Uh, it has eased up somewhat in the medicine space. We are still seeing a number of substitutions, which does, does add work for a pharmacist and pharmacy team because one medicine is prescribed and then they need to do a substitute to another, uh, which is a particular process. Uh, so yeah, it's improving, but still a way to go. What about sourcing workers? Is it hard to find labour at the moment? Labour is absolutely one of our challenges, so workforce would be one of our biggest challenges. Uh, we have a number of vacancies uh, across our network, so we're seeing workforce shortages and we're also seeing inflationary pressure, just like most New Zealand businesses are currently, uh, with lots of strategies all putting in place to address those. Now, I want to ask you about Chemist Warehouse. What do you make of its arrival in New Zealand and its rapid expansion since? Uh, Chemist Warehouse, uh, it's a discounter that's come to town, it's probably pharmacy is one of the last categories to have a discount to enter. Uh, from our point of view, we're playing in a really different space. Uh, we're not a discounter. Our strategy is about personalised care and advice and associated products. So it's a very different space and uh, that's where our focus will continue to be supporting New Zealand communities. I guess one thing about Chemist Warehouse now being here though is that it has highlighted the rather significant markup that pharmacies do charge on a lot of products. How much of a risk is that do you think in terms of consumer behaviour now that they know that they are being charged more for certain products and can get it cheaper elsewhere? Is that a very long term risk for your business? Look, there's a few bits to that. The first one is I think that the arrival of the discount channel in New Zealand actually showed us that $5 really matters. And I think that's the biggest uh, learning and we're delighted that government listened to that and has waived the prescription copay, as we mentioned, because that's really the thing about making healthcare affordable for all New Zealanders. Uh, in terms of products and pricing, look, it has had a bit of an impact on margins, but again, our strategy, it's around making sure we show value to the customer, coupled with our expert care and advice, and that's winning for us and that's our focus going forward. Are you finding that you're already having to be more competitive on the pricing front though? Uh, look, pricing hasn't changed substantially over the past few years. You are constantly reviewing pricing. So we have a pricing specialist team in the office that makes sure that we are focused on what the market is pricing and where they are pricing and making sure that we're competitive. So it's what all retailers do. So are you then going to double down on things like loyalty programs and offerings? Uh, absolutely. So loyalty, so back to our strategy, our strategy is personalised care and advice with products. So the personalisation, our loyalty program, our living rewards program is absolutely essential to that. We've got just under two million loyalty members, one of New Zealand's largest loyalty programs. Uh, you know, Kiwis love belonging to something, getting access to uh, particular discounts, particular savings, uh, particular products, uh, and getting rewarded with vouchers for their spend. And that's, I suppose, part of personalisation is to make them feel welcome, make them feel part of the Unikim and the Life Pharmacy brands. Two million people is almost half of New Zealand. That's pretty incredible. I guess that really speaks to the strength of household names like Life and Unikim Pharmacy, doesn't it? Uh, absolutely. Uh, we're very proud of the Living Rewards uh, membership base and see some really exciting things happening with that. Uh, and in terms of the brands, look, our brands are incredibly strong. Uh, in February of this year, KPMG released their annual customer experience excellence survey results. That is quite a mouthful to say. It is. Uh, <laughs> well done. Uh, and the Unikem brand uh, scored number two and the Life Pharmacy brand scored number four in the non-grocery retail section. And to give some context for that, we were up against 130 other New Zealand businesses and there are about six and a half thousand respondents. So to come out at second and fourth overall, again, it just speaks to the strength of our brand and the strength of our teams out there looking after New Zealanders absolutely every day, doing what they do best, providing expert care and advice. Now, somebody who invests in your company might know that Life and Unikem are owned by the same listed company, but to many consumers, they might look like competing brands. So why bother having two? Why not just amalgamate them into one? They play to slightly different areas of the market. So the Unikem brand is more around uh, everyday family health and wellness. 
uh, whereas the Life brand is more prestige health, beauty and wellness. So they coexist quite well. Uh, we get synergies from having them and being able to have it, the Living Rewards Loyalty Membership Club that spans both of them is just works incredibly well. I didn't know I could use Living Rewards in, at Unichem. I thought it was only Life Pharmacy. Ah, we've got some more work to do to make sure that customers know that. Yes, uh, it absolutely spans both and we welcome the Living Rewards membership at all of the stores. Thanks so much for your time, Rachel. Oh, you're welcome. Let's talk about US earnings season so far. Tesla revealed record quarterly vehicle production and revenue last week, but its gross margins are under a bit of pressure after cutting prices on its cars. On the rather entertaining earnings call, Elon Musk hinted that more cuts may come given the global economic environment. But buying a new car is a, is a big decision for the vast majority of people. So, uh, you know, anytime there's economic uncertainty, people will generally uh, pause on new, new car buying at least to see to see what happens um, and um, you know and then obviously another challenge is the the interest rate environment um, as the interest rates rise uh, the affordability of anything bought with debt decreases um, so effectively increasing the price of the car so w when interest rates rise dramatically we actually have to reduce the price of the car because the the, the interest payments increase the price of the car. Uh, so, and and this is the, the, at least at least up until recently it was the I believe the sharpest interest rate rise in history. Um, so we had to do something about that. Um, and if somebody's got a crystal ball for the global economy, I would really appreciate it if I could borrow that crystal ball. Um, <laughs> DM us. Yeah, exactly. DM me. On. <laughs> you got to admit, the guy has some humour. Overall, he said long-term it doesn't really matter because it's still a cash flow positive manufacturer, a reason he thinks to buy and hold Tesla. Investors didn't all take his advice, though. Tesla fell almost 10% on the day. Netflix was down as well, more than 8%, and that was despite its own earnings beat and adding almost 6 million subscribers in a quarter. That's after its crackdown on password sharing. So why are we so hard to impress as investors? Well, Greg Smith from Devon Funds might know an answer. Hey, Greg. Hi, Matty. Good numbers are apparently a trigger to sell now. I see. Why did Tesla and Netflix both disappoint, do you think? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you probably also have to put it in context of you know, the share price moves you've seen um, you know, this year, perhaps not quite price of perfection, but it's probably going to take a lot to keep that momentum going. So, you know, you had Tesla shares, which um, have basically doubled, more than doubled this year, and you've got Netflix, which uh, is up, was up around about sort of 50%. So, uh, you yeah, a lot sort of, a lot of expect baked in. Yeah, there was there was positives and some yeah, negatives in, in both results. Uh, but as you saw, yeah, Tesla shares down uh, 10%. And yeah, obviously we had, a, had quite a, a similar sort of sell for Netflix as well. Yeah, on Tesla specifically, quite a big focus on its gross margins and how those have reduced recently. What else do you think investors should look at when they're assessing Tesla? Should they look at its production of vehicles and potentially the ramp up of its Cybertruck too? Yeah, I think there's a few things. Look, you know, and if you look at the top and bottom line performance, it was actually really good. Good. You know, revenue's up almost 50%. You know, it's 500 million above uh, above expectations. You had net income jumping as well. You had a number of cars they're on target for producing. I think that's a really good number to look at. They're talking about 1.8 million uh, this year. And to put that in context, it was 1.3 million in 2022. So demand's going pretty well. Uh, yeah, their Model Y has actually uh, asserted uh, the RAV4 is uh, the, the best-selling car in the world, so you can't complain too much about that. But as you say, investors tend to look at profitability as well. And yeah, this uh, increase in demand and increase in, in sales, um, or unit sales that is has come at a cost and you know in terms of in terms of earnings you know, uh, I mean cutting costs we, we know the EV market Tesla hasn't got its all its own way now there's other automakers coming in um and so yeah the, the margins you know, have really sort of fallen away and 9.6 they came in at, and that's five percentage points lower than a year ago so that's pretty significant worth pointing out though Tesla still makes you know much more of a gross margin than its uh traditional automaker peers. Uh, but I think the other things that sort of, sort of got investors offside a little bit was that Elon Musk saying, you know, there's further price cuts to come. And he also talked about if interest rates continue to rise, which they may or may not, that he doesn't want uh, customers to have to sort of wear that in terms of higher borrowing costs. So, you know, he's prepared to sort of cut 
uh, cut further. Uh, and, and ultimately, you know, when, he, when you're an investor, you're looking at profitability, and he's basically less concerned about profitability in the short term. And I thought it was quite a, a classic comment on his call when he said uh, the numbers that they're reporting uh, you know, will look silly when their full drive, full self-driving uh, software is perfected. Uh, and he, he said autonomy is basically going to hit things out of the park. So time will tell on that because uh, obviously Tesla have been promising a self-driving car since at least 2016. As far as earnings calls go, though, I mean, Elon on a Tesla earnings call has got to be one of the most entertaining, don't you think, Greg? Oh, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, a million, million miles a minute type thing. But, yeah, that's the type of guy he is. Yeah, he does keep uh, investors guessing. Yeah, look at what happened with with, with Twitter. But, um, look, you know, you t- t- take a step back in terms of, you know, Big picture, you know, Tesla has delivered. You know, talk, you're talking about you know 1.8 million vehicles this year. Uh, you know, the most popular model of car. Um, you obviously, Tesla's a great brand, but it's just yeah, you know, is it from an investor's point of view? Yeah, you know, it's just sort of, I suppose, taking that with um, the, the rough of the smooth almost, yeah, you know, really. But yeah, highly entertaining on a on an earnings call, that's for sure. Let's talk about Netflix. Also, pretty impressive numbers, back to back quarterly earnings beat. Quite the turnaround from that big loss in subscribers that they reported just before Christmas. Now with that crackdown on password sharing, they're gaining them again. How impressive do you think that this is of a turnaround for Netflix? But also, how long can it last? Oh, Oh, you're quite, I mean, quite impressive. And we, so the similarities of Tesla, isn't there? I mean, uh, Netflix sort of had its all all its own way for a long time. Uh, and then Disney Plus came along that, and that uh, achieved what it took uh, Netflix a long time to do in the space of a couple of years, albeit we had the pandemic. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're facing intense, intense competition. We've obviously got cost of living pressures. So people are being a bit more choosy. You know, you go, go from having sort of five or six services to cutting back here and there. And, yeah, last year was, yeah, a real sort of shock to the system for and a bit of a wake-up call for Netflix. You have first subscriber loss, as, as you point out, in over a decade. Uh, the share price got hammered last year. So this is a real pivotal moment for them to, for them to add close to 6 million subscribers in a quarter. Uh, is really impressive. And, you know, I suppose it's about not resting on their laurels. They realise a few things need to change. You know, password sharing has been, you know, you know, you know really terrible for, for the business. You know, people have just given their passwords to friends and logins. Um, they're clamping down on that. You know, they've got that in, um, you know, initiative going and the country is covering 80% of their revenues, you know, including New Zealand. So you pay to, to add a friend, if you like, you're paying, I think it's six ninety nine. It means you won't get those nasty sort of messages implying that you're sharing your uh, your password around. So that's, yeah, that's real progress, I think, um, you know, for Netflix. The other thing as well is um, ad revenues. I thought, you know, that's, that looks to be quite promising as well. Um, you can, you know, again, it sort of dovetails into the cost of living pressures that people are facing and if people to, you know, trim inflation or, or trading down has become a bit of a thing. So you can all, also have that option now with your streaming service. You can um, put up with some ads and uh, pay a little bit less. So I think these initiatives um, for Netflix will probably really show their worth later in the year. Uh, and management, again, did say on the call that is, there is a bit of a lag defect with that. So, you know, that 6 million subscribers that they've added is, uh, is no mean feat. But the story could get even better uh, for the company later in the year. Yeah, absolutely. We'll wait and see. Good to chat, Greg. Thanks so much for your time. My pleasure. Plenty more US earnings this week, including Alphabet, Amazon, Microsoft, Meta, Snap, Spotify, Visa, Coca-Cola and Mattel. That's the maker of Barbies. Could be interesting to see what they say about the first weekend of the Barbie movie. I know I'm wearing pink, but it's actually not something I'm keen to see. Bit more of an Oppenheimer girl myself. Now go put your money to work. Thanks for watching Markets with Madison, the New Zealand Herald show for interested investors. If you want to stay up to date with financial markets, click the subscribe button below and you can watch our other episodes here. Stay up to date with all the business news and numbers as they land on nzherald.co.nz.